Bon après-midi à tous. Pour ceux qui n'étaient pas avec nous ce matin, je suis Michelle Duffy, la vice-présidente de la conseillère d'administration du Chambre du commerce. Et j'ai le plaisir d'introduire la prochaine conférencière. For those of you that weren't with us this morning, I'm Michelle Duffy, the vice chair of the Chamber's Board of Directors. And it's my pleasure to welcome our next keynote speaker as part of Recovery Road. Megan Henshaw is a global events account manager for Google. C'est sûr qu'on ne serait pas ici aujourd'hui sans les compagnies comme Google et l'Internet. We likely would not be hosting this virtual event today without Google. And I think after a year of COVID-19, we've learned just how much we depend on Google, the internet, and our social media platforms to stay connected and up to date in this virtual world in which now we live. Megan is going to lead us through what she and her colleagues at Google have seen in terms of the continued digital transformation of companies. She is going to speak to us specifically about the tourism sector, which as we know has been hit hard by this pandemic. À la fin de la présentation, on va avoir du temps pour des questions. Alors, s'il vous plaît, posez vos questions dans la fonction de chat. At the end of the presentation, we'll be moderating a Q&A based on the questions uh, that you have. So please pose them in the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Megan, it is nice to virtually meet you and the video is now yours. Hi, thank you so much for the warm welcome, Michelle. I am thrilled and honored and humbled to be with you today to share what I know and I'm seeing around experience design after the 2020 of things. So as Michelle mentioned, um, I'm the global events account manager within the real estate and workplace services uh, organization at Google. And my functional responsibilities are to partner with all of the product areas across the Google ecosystem um, and have conversations with teams throughout to really understand how events and experiences drive business and build communities. And from that understanding, I then build strategies that help our global team get our spaces and service models in alignment with both current and future demand. On a personal note, this is my partner, Kyle, and my two-year-old, Otis. When I'm not working for Google, I spend most of my time listening to or watching Baby Shark um, or reading the same four children's books on repeat. Fun Google YouTube fact, Baby Shark is the most consumed YouTube video ever. And if played consecutively, it's been watched for over 31,000 years. So on to the content. We'll jump right into the 2020 of things. So as we all experienced and know all too well, 2020 was an all you can slide for many businesses and industries. Um, at least on the shared service side of Google, we were no exception. A lot of hard, fast pivots, a lot of paralysis coming um, out of March, trying to figure out how to show up for our audiences and how to deliver um, in a really uh, different world. So since the pandemic, I personally have become a professional researcher, a social scientist, and a futurist. All things I never thought I would dabble in, but have become a really interesting and, and large part of what I do. Um, so I've spent the last 12 months not just observing and learning from my, my team's pivot to all things digital, but also consuming any and everything I can get my hands on that might provide um, compelling data or interesting insights or clues that will help us prepare for regathering and to help us make informed decisions about the next best things to build, to do, to design and offer our users. So with that, I'm really excited to, to share with you some, some key learnings based on key changes as a result of 2020. And so during my time with you today, I'll walk you through what we've seen, what we're learning and how we're thinking about appealing to our audiences moving forward. Um, full disclaimer, this is very much through my lens of experience design, but so much of these learnings and, and insight and data, um, I think can impact appealing to consumers and audiences cross industry. So I really hope you find it valuable. So back in March, our global team of a couple hundred folks um, who manage really uh, intentional bespoke event spaces across our global footprint um, and who also manage about 65,000 events per year, all pivoted to digital first strategies. None of our physical assets were any good to us. Um, so we learned a lot in that process. For example, um, digital takes more people hours and less time. 
Um, so the turnaround time to produce a digital experience um, is, is reduced by 50%. However, the planning, the stakeholder management, the support time has increased up to 210%. Um, the learning curves have been steep. And as I mentioned, stakeholder management has been really time intensive and complex. Um, and we also have had to completely evaluate our resource mix in order to do digital well. In New York City alone last year, we saw a 130% uptick in support hours. So zooming out from our team's experience, another key change is audience and consumer expectations. So as Alvin mentioned earlier, markets are changing. 2020 changed human beings. It changed people and people change markets. So how we're looking to address these changes at Google is really starting with empathy and intention. We know historically after times of mass change and upheaval, what people, what consumers need, want, and value tends to change pretty dramatically. There's a, a cognitive bias called the habit discontinuity hypothesis. If there are any other behavioral science nerds out there, I highly recommend reading some of the scientific journals around this. It's fascinating. But ultimately, this behavioral science theory just alludes to the fact that after mass change, appetite and expectations look wildly different. And businesses have to assimilate and respond accordingly. So some preliminary forecasts around this and a lot of market signals suggest that these are, are we can say these with some level of confidence, is that consumers are gonna take a more conservative approach up, across the board. They're gonna be more thoughtful around how they spend their time and their money. That cocooning and tribalism may continue for the foreseeable future. That slow hobbies are gonna to continue to be on the rise. So things that aren't traditional escapism or aren't consumption based, but are more grounding and mindful that we're going to continue to see people show fierce loyalty to brands that are authentic and focused on doing good in the world. And that we're going to see a move to preference for privacy and more uh, uh, shared experience based communities and a move away from traditional social media platforms. There's a lot happening right now, actually, that that tells us that this is probably true. And I think all of this is going to evolve on a much faster than normal timeline because we're going to be assimilating into micro norms for the next couple of years on our way to the new normal, whatever that looks like. So it's really important to keep a finger on the pulse of market trends, behavioral analysis, um, so that we're doing our best to have informed forecasts and, and pivoting and assimilating accordingly. The next big change uh, in learning is that our collective relationship with technology has changed and will continue to change on a rapid timeline. So a lot of this, this digital transformation, these trends existed pre-COVID, right? But 2020 was definitely an accelerant. It was lighter fluid um, for digital transformation. And what would have taken likely years got condensed into months or even weeks in some cases. At this point, the world has assimilated to digital ways of doing business, to digital ways of gathering and building communities. So we think anything that can be done well via technology will. So now that we've reached this collective acceptance of, okay, we're doing this now, we've really pivoted to segment and say, all right, how do we do what matters well? We've known for a really long time, especially in the events world, that digital platforms have advantages. We knew they were great for content sharing. They extend the reach and the life of your content. You can reach more diverse audiences. You have better data and analytics. The speed to market is faster. Um, they're more scalable. But I think a couple of new big advantages that are top of mind coming out of 2020 is the safety and the sustainability from a carbon footprint perspective. I also think that after a year of everything coming to you in your home, which isn't always a good thing, but the convenience factor of digital ways of engaging, it's now a new convenience service, right? This is the Postmates of events. So we really have to think through that with our engagement strategies moving forward. So we will regather, and I personally cannot wait for cocktail hours and hugs, but I think it's gonna be important to be wary of binary bias around this. And I think in our industry, um, the events industry, there are sort of two camps, right? Um, that there's going to be so much pinup demand that everything's going to go back to phys shared physical spaces and in person. Um, and then there's everything is going to be digital with in person sort of as a supplement or augmented, 
augmentation to that. And I don't think either of those are right. I think we're going to land somewhere in the middle. And I think we have to be um, really thoughtful around providing options for our audiences to engage with us. I think that's going to be key to creating brand loyalty. And I also think it's really exciting to see technologies becoming more usable, more accessible, more intentional, um, so that those strategies can become an ever more impactful part of multi-channel engagement across industries. And then last big change uh, as a result of 2020 is how we approach experience design as a whole. Um, so in 2021, video, including web conferencing like this, will account for 80% of all internet traffic. So the events and experiences industry is currently going through what so many others have when it comes to digital alternatives being introduced to their market. So what music went through, right, with Napster, what television went through with streaming services. And I think we have a really good opportunity, nay, responsibility to learn from what those industries went through to capitalize on the opportunities they may have missed and to minimize the pain of our transition. So we have some hurdles to overcome with digital experiences right now. Um, some data uh, on average, 35% of visual, vis virtual attendees, excuse me, uh, may not show up to the event. 31% of event professionals say engagement remains the biggest challenge for virtual. 43% of marketers find it difficult to replicate traditional event formats in virtual models. And the average attendee, virtual attendee, watches about 68% of a virtual session. So all of these things have to be factored into how we design our experiences and they have to be accounted for. But I think being really thoughtful about not dragging old ways of doing things into a very new paradigm um, is important. And also being aware of dusty or outdated language and mindsets is crucial. Um, I'm seeing a lot of self-fulfilling prophecy happening in our industry right now. Example, it's impossible to connect meaningfully via technology. I disagree. I actually think this is a very intimate way to communicate. You all are in my home right now. Um, and I've made a lot of friends during this time leveraging technology solutions. I think the cognitive load is harder, yes. Scientifically, we know that. But most new things are hard. And we're still very much assimilating to, to doing digital ways of, of a lot of these things, right? And our techno-social norms are still evolving rapidly. So we will continue to evolve as will our norms and our relationship with technology and our comfort levels. So while we've been social engineering toward ideal outcomes in physical spaces for a really long time, we're just getting started doing that in digital spaces. So how can we work together to expedite the journey um, with multi-channel engagement strategy? So next, Based on all of these learnings and all of these sort of paradigm shifts as a result of 2020, I'm going to share uh, an aggregation of signals. This is not um, uh, proven. Some of these assumptions may be incorrect, but these are informed forecasts. I've really been lobbying hard at Google to get a crystal ball invented, but we're not there yet. So while I'm excited to share what we're merging, a lot of this is data driven. Um, some of this could shift as we've seen this is an ever evolving situation. So these could be based on data and all of the research that we've done internally, externally, key measures of success in a post 2020 world with reaching um, and maintaining audience engagement and connection. The first being community. So creating oppor opportunities for social content and community is the new commodity. We're moving away from experience marketing and into community marketing. Community becomes the, the, the value and the intention moves from selling and recruiting to caring and connection. So I think we're seeing very much, especially in digital space, access to others with similar goals and our passions will be the way to drive engagement and desired behavior. Um, we think that experiences need to unite, whether that's happening digitally or in person. The second key factor is well-being. So making sure that we're considering people, where and how they are, explicitly demonstrating it and communicating it. So well-being has expanded to include physical and mental space, 
people's physical and mental health, their security and their comfort level. Trust is key. And I think as we move back into shared physical spaces, which is I'm, I'm calling regathering because it's not going to look the same as it did um, in a, in a pre-pandemic world, we have to be really thoughtful about making people feel considered and seen, being tolerant of variable risk tolerance, um, reality versus optics when it comes to people's safety. In hospitality, we always used to want um, all of the cleaning and uh, the, the space maintenance back of house, right? Well, now it needs to be front and center. We need to make people um, see and hear how much we're, we're acting in order to keep them safe. And then the last key success factor is choice. So thoughtful, functional options that allow people to engage in their preferred way. So we were all robbed of all of our choices in 2020. So I think this is something that is really gonna resonate with uh, post-2020 society. Um, making sure that we set expectations around the pros and cons of all of our offerings, but allowing people to um, have autonomy over their personal experiences. Um, I think people who offer choices and say, we trust you to make your own decisions will win. In our industry, I think that's gonna take further segmentation um, we haven't always done this well, but reimagining how we curate off offerings to our segment and audiences um, will be important as well. So um, it's, it's human. If, if we're designing something for everyone, it's for no one. So making sure we're approaching design in a human centered way that is both visionary and informed based on our audience segmentation. And then last but not least, um, a couple people have mentioned today how brutal 2020 was on many industries, events being one of them, um, and hospitality as a whole, as we heard from earlier, had a rough year. Um, I do believe wholeheartedly, though, that this sector is more relevant and more important than ever. And as we reemerge, bringing people together to solve problems is critical. When has there ever been a time with more problems to solve? Delivering moments of delight and joy matters after what we went through last year. So I'm a firm believer that, you know, this industry is the mechanism by which those things are done strategically and optimally. So what we do matters, I think more than ever. And 2021 may continue to feel a lot like 2020 for several months to come, but that doesn't mean that we can't use this time to get scrappy, to try things, to co-create with our audiences, to bring them in and give them a seat. Um, and to collaborate with one another across domains and disciplines. I think 2021 will be a time of mass experimentation and measurement, and this is going to set us up for a comeback in a big way. So with that, I do have a couple of resources I wanted to share with you. You will all be getting these slides. Um, so these are just some, some resources through Google that are specific to our Canadian communities. Um, Nearly two thirds of all new jobs created since 2010 require digital skills. So we've actually launched some really accessible, amazing content, um, career certificates for digital skills, a lot of things that you can tap into. Um, we have a shop here program for retail sector. The Small Business Hub um, is another resource uh, repository for small businesses across industries. Um, and then Skillshop and Google Academy are also educational repositories for skill building. And then if you're interested in going down a rabbit hole around behavioral scientist or forecasting, these are some articles that have been really valuable to me and my team um, and just wanted to share in case those were of interest to you all. So with that, I will say thank you for the time. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I've included my LinkedIn uh, hyperlink here. So once you get these slides, please feel free to reach out if I can support you in any way, or if you'd like to continue the conversation, um, I would love that. Thanks so much. Um, I'll remind our audience that you can pose questions uh, just using the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, to, but to kick us off, we do have a bit of time for questions, Megan, so I'll get us started. Um, I'm wondering, how do small business operators who don't have an in-house IT or the expertise make that transition to a digital market? 
Great question. <laughs> um, so I actually didn't have a whole lot of expertise in digital events when the pandemic hit last year. And I immediately found, went on LinkedIn and started pinging people that I thought could help educate me and provide resources. Um, I think collaboration is so important in our industry right now and working together helps expedite our journey to rebuilding and awesome. So my first recommendation is reach out to, to peers, not just in your industry, but across domains and ask what they've used to upskill. A lot of that stuff is free right now. Um, so that would be my recommendation. I also have some things that may be of value. So do feel free to use that LinkedIn um, link and find me and I'm happy to support as well. Okay. Um, our next question is from one of our participants named Michelina. Her question is, as we're not prepared for the internet and bandwidth capabilities, will we be better prepared for digital needs when the world reopens for travel and event planning? Um, one hopes. Um, I'm not sure about the bandwidth challenges. Maybe I could get some more clarity on exactly what those pain points were um, in order to potentially on the back end suggest some resources. Oh, they're talking in rural areas. So, you know, New Brunswick has a lot of rural areas and I think bandwidth capabilities and that ability to, to produce online has been challenging for some. Yeah, so this is something we've been talking about a lot. In some ways, uh, digital is far more accessible. In some ways, it's far less. Um, I know Google is currently working on a couple of X projects to work through some of this in rural areas. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a major problem. Um, and I'm happy to take the conversation offline to see if there's any specific resources I could provide. Okay. Mark. Um, so this is a great question um, from Mark LaPointe. Uh, do you have any data on online charitable donations during the pandemic versus pre-pandemic like 2019? For Google specifically? Um, I'd say, well, yeah, does Google have any access to data on what's been for like online donations as a whole, I guess? So, so our online donations internally have more than doubled. I think we're seeing a lot of people want to invest time and energy into giving back to communities to doing good in the world. And that sort of speaks to like these behavioral trends and changes. People are starting to realize that's more important than consumerism. Um, so we've definitely seen a huge uptick in give back campaigns internally. Um, I haven't looked at that across industries, um, but if Google's any indication of what that looks like um, from a societal perspective, I would say absolutely. We're, we're also hearing from Googlers that they don't want home drops or swag, they actually wanna give back. Um, so instead of receiving gifts themselves, they wanna give back to their local um, commun and domestic communities. That's great, that's awesome. Um, so much of the tourism experience or industry is seeing, feeling and living this. With global travel restrictions, how do you think someone who owns a B&B &B or a restaurant or a campground make it through COVID without that access to a live audience? So I, I think I've seen a lot of really creative pivots already. Um, so, and, and I don't think domestic travel, I think it's starting to pick back up, right? So it's like, how, how are you marketing to your clientele? Um, like we're going to an Airbnb this weekend that's drivable. I think it's more marketing locally. Um, so people don't have to get on a plane. If you look at the data, the travel is the part that people are hesitant about, the airline travel mostly. And international travel is like 78% of people are very uncomfortable with that right now. So I think marketing to your local communities and saying like, hey, a change of atmosphere could be great. And it definitely makes a huge difference for all of us when we're trapped in four walls all the time, um, could be a great way to see an uptick um, in adoption. Um, but yeah, I, I would also be happy to, um, and I'll send this to the team, the planning team, um, there's some really interesting market or data around um, what people are most hesitant about doing once we start to reemerge versus like what they're ready to do. And that's some, those are some really interesting insights. Okay. So um, last question, um, very selfishly from myself. Um, I work in human resources and I just, you know, I have an employee who, of Google in front of me, so I have to ask the question. You're working from home. 
Um, what are some of the great things that Google is doing as an employer supporting their employees um, through, through COVID, through this pandemic, through working from home? You know, kind of maybe tell us some of the good and the, and the not so good. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that any company has gotten this perfect, um, but I think Google is very focused on mental health and supporting Googlers through what has been a really challenging time of grief and loss um, over the last 12 months. So they're offering a lot of resources around that. They're doing a lot of um, at-home health and wellness offerings. Um, there's carers leave for folks who are struggling to transition with caring with children and working from home as schools are opening, closing, opening, closing throughout the United States and abroad. Um, so they they have they they have some really thoughtful and intentional offerings that I think are helping people feel like they can take a step back from work because it's not the most important thing, um, and also um, you know provide some of the same perks and cool things that you can expect on a Google campus, um, and that comes to you straight into your home. So um, would be happy to share more about this too. But lots of health and wellness offerings, cooking classes, all sorts of fun social stuff. Um, and then really giving people the time and space to deal with all of the many personal challenges we have as well. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Megan, for your time. We really appreciate it, really enjoy speaking with you. Um, and when we can travel again, you're more than welcome to come up to New Brunswick and I will have a cocktail with you for sure, maybe two. I cannot wait. Thank you so much, great to be here. Thank you. All right, folks, we're in the final stretch of the recovery road. We're just about to turn the final bend in the road. We're gonna take a quick break and we're gonna return at 1.30 with our final keynote speaker, Frank McKenna.